Okay, this morning um, I'm going to talk about the different types of crowns there are in the Bible. I know you've um, probably seen crowns in the Bible. I, I don't know if you realize there are different types of crowns and the link between them. So hopefully um, it's an interesting sermon for you because I know, you know, as you read through the Bible, you see crowns, you see crowns. You know we're going to be rewarded with crowns and there's going to be crowns. There's, there's, crown, there's, there's crowns. But I, I doubt uh, most people have really looked into it and really con- sort of considered the different crowns and, and what they all represent and uh, how they can be earned. So we'll look at the different crowns in the Bible. And obviously when we talk about crowns, when the word crown is used in the Bible, um, you know, it, represents, it represents authority, doesn't it? Like a king wears a crown. It's something that shows that you, you're given power or authority over something. Kind of reminds me of the parable of the, the, the ten pounds, if you remember, on Baptism Sunday, when you know, the servants came and they multiplied their pounds. What, the one given one pound multiplied to ten. He was given authority over ten cities. So I think that's what these, these crowns represent. And generally in the Bible, it is talking about a physical crown unless it's talking about the top of something, like the crown of your head. Uh, um, we're talking about the crowns that are the actual headpiece or, or figuratively or anag- uh, analogous to the headpiece. Um, I'm not 100% sure whether we'll be rewarded with actual, you know, because I mean, if, if, the, if the streets of heaven are paved with gold, right, well, what good does a gold crown do? So are these crowns physical crowns that we'll be wearing during the thousand year reign of Christ or something like that? Or are these just uh, um, figurative crowns to represent other things. I, I think they're, they're mainly figurative as we go through and have a look at them. But I don't know if you've realized the, um, the link and the consistency in the Bible uh, when it talks about crowns. And I just wanted to show you that today because it's quite interesting. The first one we'll see, the first crown in the Bible is the crown of glory. The crown of glory. And we read about that in 1 Peter 5 here says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being ensamples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So we see here the crown of glory. Now you might be asking, now is, it, is this crown of glory, is this something that is only for um, bishops? Because it's talking about here, about bishops feeding the flock of God and being a good example, and then they shall receive a crown of glory. I don't think it is only for the bishops, but I think bishops can earn this crown because one of their primary primary roles is to be a good example. Now, how do we earn this crown? I think this crown is earned by uh, your testimony, by being a good example. We see there in um, verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Now, that's something that we can all do. Right? That's not just something that I can do. That's something that we can all do. We can all be a good example to other people, whether it's believer or unbeliever. Um, <clears throat> let's look at a couple of other verses where we see the crown of glory. Proverbs 4. I just want you to see this consistency uh, of this crown and talking about the, the example that you set. Proverbs 4. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and tend to know understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was, I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forsake it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. So you can see here it's talking about the wisdom, the law, keeping God's commandments. Forsake her not, she shall preserve thee. Love her and she shall keep thee. Talking about wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. Look at this. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. So we see here again the crown of glory linked in to keeping the commandments and having that that good testimony. 
Um, let's go to Proverbs 12, verse 3. Look at this, a man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. And uh, verse 4 in particular, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. So we see here that a virtuous woman, I mean, what, what makes a woman virtuous, right? It's her works, it's a good testimony. We read in Proverbs 31, and we read about the virtuous woman. It's not just a woman that's beautiful, right? I mean, we read in Proverbs 31 that favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. So this virtuous woman is, is a woman, is, is how she lives. It's a righteous living, her testimony. And a virtuous woman, it says here, is a crown to her husband. I think there's a link there with this crown of glory and this good example of a woman being a crown to her husband. And a point that I just want to make here is, if you are a, a virtuous woman, if you are a good wife, you'll make your husband look good. You know, that's why it's saying a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. How many times you see women, they think they're so spiritual, they think they're so, they're, they're so mature in the faith, but they make their husband look like an idiot. They belittle their husband. You know, everyone, when, 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 they, when they ask, uh, you know, the way the wife talks about her husband, they would... would when you talk about your husband, do people think more of your husband or do they think less of your husband? Because they ought to think more of your husband. Your husband ought to look like more of a man the more virtuous of a woman you are, right? Because you ought to be a crown to your husband. And it's funny because it, it, this really does happen. That if a woman is spiritual and she's doing the right thing, she reverences her husband, she submits to her husband, she'll make her husband look more of a man than, she, than he really is. And I'll give you an example just from my own life. I, I know my, like my wife, like people think I'm a lot more domineering and I'm a lot more like probably strong-willed than I really am. It's just that my, my wife is a godly wife that she makes me seem that way to other people. And I remember, um, you know, even at work when, you know, like my wife, you know, makes meals for me and I bring like home-cooked meals to work. And, you know, the guys at work are always like, oh, man, you know, like, you really have your house in order sort of thing. And, it's, and, 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 it, and it just reminds me of this verse because it, it's not all me. You know, it's, it's not that I'm just this manly man. And you, you, guys, you guys that know me that know me well, I'm not really that macho type of a man. But, um, but if your wife is a godly, virtuous woman, she'll make you seem more of a man than you really are. You know, she'll, she'll be that crown um, to her husband. So we see there that, that good example being linked into that crown. Let's uh, look at another uh, crown, Proverbs 16. And these are all familiar verses, but I just don't know if you've uh, like sort of linked these together the way that, that, um, that I've seen them. Uh, Proverbs 16.31, The hoary head is a crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness. So it's saying here that the, white, the hoary head, the white head of an old person um, is a crown of glory if, it, if it's found in the way of righteousness. So it's not a crown of glory if it's found in the way of unrighteousness. So if an old person is a bad example, a bad testimony, the white hair is not a crown of glory. But if they have a white head, the hoary head, and it is found in the way of righteousness, it is a crown of glory to that person because they have that testimony. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 62. Verse 8. <coughs> you just see a crown of glory again. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. So you see here, he's saying that other nations will see the righteousness um, of, uh, and the Gentiles, in verse 2, shall see thy righteousness. So that example, that testimony, and then they, he's saying that, Israel or you know Jerusalem will be this crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. So again, this crown of glory, glory, uh, glory being linked uh, with being a good example. 
Now let's go to Matthew 12. So something for you to consider. You know, if you want this crown of glory, if you want to earn this crown of glory for the Lord, is how are your actions or your inactions affecting others? What's your testimony like? What's your example like? You know, are you setting a good example or are you setting a bad example? Um, look at this verse in Matthew 12, verse 30. It says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth, scattereth abroad. And one thing that's uh, very important to know about how you live your life is that there's no middle ground. Everything you do is either gathering for the Lord or scattering. Because some people just think, you know what, I just want to live the Christian life and I just want to coast through, I just want to be neutral. There is no neutral ground when it comes to Christianity. If you're, if you're doing nothing, you're scattering. Otherwise, you need to be gathering uh, with the Lord. And you know, we all have a bit of gathering and a bit of scattering in our life. We're not always all gathering. But it's just for something to you, for you to reflect on. It's good for some personal reflection. Is What is my life doing? Am I, is my life a life that gathers for the Lord? Or is my life a life that scatters for the Lord? There is no middle ground. Look at this verse in uh, Luke 13. <clears throat> I'm always reminded when um, I think of our example and how our example affects other people. I'm always reminded of this parable in Luke 13. Uh, he spake also this parable... A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto them, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig it about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So we see this parable of this, this fig tree and the husband, you know, the, somebody comes to it and, and tries to find fruit on it and there's no fruit on this fig tree. But the thing I want to point out about this fig tree is look in verse 7. He says, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down and look at this. Why cumbereth it the ground? So you see how this fruitless fig tree, it's not just neutral. It's actually drawing nutrients from the soil. I mean, you think about it, it's taking up space. It's taking sun that could be otherwise given to the, to, the, to the trees or the plants underneath it. And this is why God wants to get rid of it. Because it actually does draw resources. And it's the same like that. It's same in a church. Because you know, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is like a soil. And we're all like these plants planted in this soil. And if you're a plant that doesn't have any fruit, you're not a good testimony. You know, you're not reading your Bible and praying. You're not going soul winning. It's not a neutral position to be in because you're actually drawing resources. And not, you know, obviously there's the physical resources. I'm not worried about the physical resources. I'm thinking about more the spiritual resources, just you know, the, the, the spiritual drain that you may take from other people by not getting involved in the work. And you know, I know we're all at different points in time. You guys know who you are. I'm not, not trying to be hard on you if you don't go soul winning. But I just want to encourage you um, to, to get involved and just provoke you onto love and good works. And I just wanted you to see here that Look in verse 7, he says, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. So there is this patience that's involved. So I'm not like, you know, I understand that we we're all at different points in time. We all have that fear. And we've talked about it. I've talked about it with all you guys before. But, uh, you know, we're all at different points in our spiritual life. But it's up to us who are more spiritual to be patient with people. You know, don't get frustrated with people just because they don't do the amount of soul winning that you guys do. Um, or if they're not going soul winning at all. You know, we want to keep encouraged encouraging people that aren't going soul winning yet to get involved. Um, you know, it takes time. You know, we didn't get to where we were overnight. And even uh, Jesus here, he, when he's telling the parable, he realizes that this, this um, <clears throat> person that comes seeking fruit on this fig tree is being patient. I mean, he's coming year after year for three years. And even after three years, when he says, I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and he says, you know, cut it down, he still allows the dresser to give it one more chance. He says, hey, you know, let me, let me just dung it and dig about it and just see one more time if it'll bear fruit. And that's what I want to do this morning. You know, I just want to heap some dung on, <laughs> on, your, on your fig tree, you know, get some, get some fruit growing on there. You know, and you know the thing with dung, right, is, is it's good for plants, isn't it? It's good for plants because it provides nutrients and it helps the fruit to grow, but it's not always pleasant to receive, is it? 
You know, you're shoveling the dung and putting the dung. You know, I remember we put chicken poo on the lawn. And this this is this why this time I bought like the, the non-chicken poo fertilizer. Because like for a week or two, like, you know, the place was just smelling like poo. Um, but it did good for the grass. That's why in the grass you can see some, some uh, stronger patches now. Because we put that dung on, on the lawn. Uh, we let it alone uh, so that it would bear some more, or in this case, more... Uh, Grass, uh, what are they called? What are grass leaves called? What's the word I'm looking for? Anyways. So my point is, you know, we, we ought to be patient with one another, you know, and it's not about just being hard on people that aren't soul winning yet, right, guys? It's about encouraging everyone to provoke unto love and good works. It's about getting us all going in the right direction, going where we need to go. And, and the way I think of it in church, you know, even though people that aren't involved in the work or aren't as involved as some of us are, even though they, yes, you know, we can say they're a drain on the spiritual resources of this church. But, you know, we that are, you know, further along in our spiritual life ought to bear that spiritual drain. You know, don't think, don't, don't look down on your brother in Christ and just say, you know, why are you always taking, always taking, and always taking? Because we all take, right? And we all take sometimes, sometimes, sometimes we come to church and we need to take more than we give. You know, and other times, you know, it's like in the Bible where it talks about, you know, the money. There are, there are times when I have more money, I can help somebody else. And there are other times when that person has more money and I will need help. There's a time to give and there's a time to receive. There's, it works the same in churches. There's a time to give and there's a time to receive. So don't get upset at people just because they're always taking because, you know, we ought to, um, maybe it's a time where we ought to give. And the other way I think of it as well, it's like uh, children in church. You know, like, uh, you know, we want children in church. We don't want everyone to be here. So I don't want to necessarily get people out of church, you know, be hard on them and get, get them out of church where now they're no longer under the, the word of God. They're no longer under the preaching. They're no longer under the encouragement. I want them at least to stay. So it's not about, you know, if you're not going soul winning, then get out of here. I don't want you to be here. No, I want you to be here because for chances are if you get out of here, you'll never go soul winning. You know, now if you're anti-soul winning, then I don't want you here because that, that if you're against the soul winning program, then it's, this is not the church to be in. But if you are for the soul winning program, you're just not into it yet. You know, I want you to be here because I want you to be under the preaching. I want you to be encouraged by it. And even though, uh, you know, like I was saying, you know, you'll, you'll be a spiritual drain, I guess, to the other people. You know, I think those of us who are going soul winning, uh, we ought to think of them like the children in the church. You know, we have the children here, you know, do they maybe take away from, um, you know, how quiet it is or how easy it is to, 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 um, to concentrate? But we suffer them, don't we? You know, we who are more spiritual, we say, hey, you know what? Yeah, people do take more than they give to this church. But for those of us who are in this church, we just need to think of it the right way and carry them and um, help them to grow in the Lord. Okay, so... There's no neutral ground. So just think about how your testimony is affecting other people. <clears throat> All right, let's go into the next uh, crown. So that was the crown of glory. Uh, Isaiah 28. Now this next crown is not really a crown you want to earn, but it's linked in to the crown of glory. And I just want to show you the... the how it, it compares to the crown of glory. Look at here in Isaiah 28. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is as a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden under feet, and the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be as a fading flower. And as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up, in that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. So we see here the crown of Pride. And a couple of things I just want you to note here about the crown of pride, because it's linked in with the crown of glory. You see there in verse 5. Now the crown of pride, how does it differ to the crown of glory? Well, the crown of pride we see here is it's, is it's temporary, isn't it? 
See how it says, whose glorious beauty is as a fading flower? Now the crown of glory is an eternal crown, isn't it? It's something that you take into eternity with you. But the crown of pride is something that's temporary. Now notice that it is beautiful, isn't it? It says, that to, uh, whose glorious beauty is as a fading flower. So this crown of pride is something that is something that somebody might desire because it is beautiful. It is something that um, people in this world would desire, but it's temporary. Now, what's the problem with the crown of pride? I mean, because when you compare it to the crown of glory, well, it's, it's unrighteousness, isn't it? It's a crown of sinfulness, a crown of bad example, as opposed to the crown of glory, which is a crown of good example and righteousness. And it's interesting that even in this passage, the two are actually contrasted, where it says you've got the crown of pride and then you've got the crown of glory. And I think an interesting thing as well with verse 5, it says, In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory. So remember how I talked about before, us being a crown of glory, you know, our righteousness. But you know, our righteousness is actually Christ's righteousness. So our righteousness is actually the Lord. And that's why it's interesting there in verse 5, it says that the Lord of hosts is actually our crown of glory because it's only through Him that our righteousness is even acceptable in His sight. So we can see um, there that it's beautiful, but it's temporary. We can see that it's a crown of sinfulness as opposed to a crown of righteousness. We see here that you know the Lord will cast it down. Uh, where it says here in verse 2, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. So it's a crown that's going to be cast down. Um, now just on that point of, uh, let's go to Jeremiah 9. Because it's interesting here how this crown of glory um, it links in with uh, the Lord being our crown of glory. Uh, look at what it says here in Jeremiah 9. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth, and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So just in that verse in Isaiah um, 28.5 where it says that the Lord of hosts is our crown of glory. And we see here in Jeremiah 9 that if we are to glory in anything, let us glory in the Lord. And I just wanted to compare this verse because this verse is actually quoted twice in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians uh, 1, and I just want to show you... <laughs> how it uh, links in with these, um, uh, with these, uh, these, this glorying in the Lord. It says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So that's our First Corinthians 1, and let's go to First Corinthians 10. And again, so talking about glorying in the Lord. Uh, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring, by, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labours, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by, your, uh, by you according to our rule abundantly. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand, but he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. So again, 
we see here that <clears throat> our glory is the Lord. And if we're going to glory in something, then we ought to glor glory in the Lord. Now, a couple of applications for us to consider when it comes to the crown of pride is, you know, service and humility um, are rewarded with glory, aren't they? Service and humility are rewarded with glory. Uh, let's go to Philippians 2. And we'll see uh, when it talks about Jesus Christ. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory, glory of God the Father. So remember we talked about uh, you know, the, being a good, a good example. It's how you earn this crown of glory. And it's interesting that the opposite of the crown of glory is the crown of pride. And we have this principle in the Bible where if you exalt yourself, then you're going to be abased. You know, God is going to cast down the crown of pride. God is our crown of glory. And we see here that Jesus Christ was a servant. He served. He humbled himself and became obedient even unto death. And he was exalted. Right? So again, this glory comes from service and humili um, humility. I won't turn to all the passages that I have here, but you know, uh, Jesus talks about you know, the kings of this world exercise dominion over each other, but it will not be like that amongst us. He says, the greatest of you shall be servant of all. So again, if you humble yourself and you serve, you'll be exalted um, in the eyes of God. <clears throat> The other verse I just wanted to show you here in Jeremiah 13. That's interesting. It says here in Jeremiah 13, verse 15, Hear ye and give ear, be not proud, for the Lord hath spoken. So again, see here how it's pride, lifting yourself up. Give glory to the Lord your God. See the glorying in the Lord? Because before he caused darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains, and while ye look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. Look at this. But if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride, and mine eye shall weep sore and run down with tears, because the Lord's flock is carried away captives. Say unto the king and to the queen, Humble yourselves, sit down, for your principality shall come down, even the crown of your glory. Now, isn't it interesting there that this crown, it's not the crown of glory, but it's the crown of your glory. And the crown of your glory is the crown of pride that's temporary, that's going to be cast down. Um, the crown of your glory is not the crown that you want to wear. It's the crown of glory, which is the Lord's righteousness, glorying in the Lord. So that's the crown of pride. That's uh, linked very closely to the crown of glory. Now let's go on to the next crown. <clears throat> But we, brethren, being taken, this is uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoured the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. And look at this. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So what's this third crown I want to talk about? Well, it's the crown of rejoicing. Now, how do we earn this crown of rejoicing? Well, we earn this crown of rejoicing by winning souls to Jesus Christ. And, you know, what, what more to rejoice about than bringing souls with you to heaven? Because what can you bring to heaven besides other souls? You, know, you can't bring your car, you can't bring your boat, you can't bring all the goods, you can't bring your house or your properties. All you can bring to heaven are other souls. So it's a crown that is worth trying to earn, and it's definitely a crown worth rejoicing over. Now, Paul says here in 1 Thessalonians 2, he says, what is our crown of rejoicing? Now, is this a physical crown that we're actually, um, actually earning? No, because he says in verse 19, 
are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this crown of rejoicing is going to be all the people that you influenced and helped win to the Lord Jesus Christ when you get to heaven, right? So this is a great crown. Hey, maybe you want this crown as big as possible, right? As many spikes on that crown. Maybe all the different spikes on the crown represent um, the number of souls that you've won to the Lord. Uh, look here in Numbers. just want to compare it to this verse. Numbers 53. Because when we get to heaven, I do believe that we'll be rewarded based on the number of people that we've helped win to the Lord. Look at this verse in Numbers. <clears throat> now the context here, you know, they're going into the promised land. Um, you know, they're dividing now the land amongst the different tribes. And this verse here is quite interesting. It says here in verse 53, Unto these the land shall be divided for an inheritance according to the number of the names. So you see how the inheritance in the promised land was divided amongst the tribes according to how many people were in that tribe. To many thou shalt give the more inheritance, and to few thou shalt give the less inheritance. To every one shall his inheritance be given according to those that were numbered of him. So if a tribe had more people, it was given more land. If a tribe had less people, it, would it was given less land. And I think what this is representing to us is when we eventually go into the promised land, right, and we get our inheritance, it's going to be based on the number of children you have. Now, it's not the number of physical children like it was based on in the Old Testament, but it's going to be based on the number of spiritual children you have. How many spiritual children have you helped to birth? That's going to determine your, uh, the size, I guess, of your crown of rejoicing. So it's interesting there. The more children they had, the more land they were given. I think that means the more spiritual children we have as believers, the more inheritance we're going to be given. Now, just another verse to show you this link with soul winning um, with a crown. Let's uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 9. We'll just go down to verse 16. Very famous passage about Paul um, exhorting us to preach the gospel. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. You see, we have a responsibility to preach the gospel. You know, even if you, you know, you think you're doing God a favor by going soul winning. No, he says, woe unto you if you don't go soul winning. Because it's our duty as Christians to do. If we, if we do all that, we spend our life soul winning. You know, we, we've just done what God has commanded us to do. Yes, we'll be rewarded. You know, we'll be rewarded for that. But it doesn't change the fact that we're commanded to do that. If I preach not the gospel, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He says, hey, if you do it, you're going to get a reward if you do it willingly. right? But if you don't go and do it, you're commanded to do it anyway. Um, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. The, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain them all. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Now look at this. So he's just talked about preaching the gospel, about soul winning. And look at this. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. So he's saying, hey, preach the gospel in a way that you want to win that prize. You want to win that race. Now look at this, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So he says when people, you know, when they get really good at something, whether it's good at a sport or good at a skill, you know, they, they're spending all this time and effort and money and training to earn something that's corruptible, meaning it's not even going to last. Remember the crown of pride? That, that, that's beautiful for a fleeting moment, but isn't, isn't eternal. 
And he's saying, like, if somebody is going to strive that much, this is what I think, if somebody's going to strive that much for something that is temporary, I mean, how much should we strive in order to earn something that is eternal? And you know, this is why when you go soul winning, guys, treat it seriously. You know, when you go soul winning from door to door, don't just go flippantly door to door and just, you know, pass the time. Oh, you know, if I talk to somebody, no big deal, just chit chatting. Hey, we're doing a serious job when we go soul winning. We're going soul winning to win souls. And that doesn't mean you can't have fun, but it just means when you go soul winning, hey, treat it seriously. You want to be temperate in all things. You want to be disciplined. And this is why when I think when we go soul winning and, and, and when we think about soul winning, we want to treat it seriously and we want to become a master at it, don't we? We don't want to just go soul winning, ill prepared, week after week after week. Hey, if there's a question that people ask you at the door, find out what the answer is so that next time you know the answer. Hey, you know there's a lot of Muslims in this area, learn a bit about Islam. You know, learn a bit about it, read up about it, have some, have some you know, like, spiritual punches in your arsenal so the next time when you talk to a Muslim, you don't just think, oh, well, they're, no, they're not listening to me. No, they're not listening to you because you're not prepared. You know, but because if you were prepared to talk to them, if you were prepared to talk to the Catholic, if you were prepared to talk to the Jehovah's Witnesses, that conversation would go a lot better. Hey, and it's something worth striving for. Hey, people strive for a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible. So it's something worth investing your time in, even if you know, you're not a bishop, you're not an elder of a church. Hey, we're all soul winners. We're all, we're all uh, meant to be winning souls for the Lord. Hey, let's treat that as a serious job. Uh, that is our purpose on this earth after all. So this crown of rejoicing, it's winning souls to Jesus Christ. So some applications for us to consider. You know, how much time do you really have left? You know, don't keep putting off soul winning putting off soul winning again and again and again. Um, how, how many weeks do you have left in your life? You know, we talked about that at Baptism Sunday. You know, how much time do you have left to, to keep putting off soul winning? You know, I really don't think I do that much soul winning. You know, I go, I go every week. But I go every week because I, I need to make sure I invest some time going soul winning. I mean, how, I don't know how many hours I are in a week, but I spend maybe like two hours, two to three hours a week soul winning. Can I really say, oh, look, look at me, look how great of a soul winner I am. Two to three hours a week. You know, how many hours do we get? How many hours does God give us? You know, and we only spend that little, and that's if you go weekly. You know, let's say you go monthly. You know, you're spending even less time you know, building this crowd of rejoicing. How much time do you, of your life do you have left? Don't waste it. And also, how much time do they have left? You know, like, yeah, maybe they've heard the gospel before. They don't have any excuse before they, when they stand before God. You know, the gospel has gone out throughout the whole world. But hey, we make a difference. You know, we can convince them. We can, we can change their mind. You know, they may have already heard about Jesus Christ and said and rejected it. And when we come, we can change their mind. You know, and that's the difference that we can make. How much time do they have left before they go to hell? You know, it makes me think, you know, and I got to follow up on this Muslim guy. Because, it, you know, like this, I remember speaking to this Muslim guy. I was with Alex and you remember he was... He was saying, oh, next year sometime he's actually going on his pilgrimage. And I just think, you know, how many Muslims are out there or how many people are out there, they're tossing up between two sides and they're at that point in their life where we can change their mind. And the longer we leave it, the longer we leave it, the more and more they get into Islam to the point that now it's too late. You know, now they're that, that you know, niqab wearing lady or now they're the guy that wears the long robe and it's too late for them. Because they're already too deep in that religion, it's hard to get them out. How much time do we have left to convince others to change their mind? Now the last, or the second last crown I want to show you is in 2 Timothy 4. <coughs> and this I, think, this I think is interesting. Um, 2 Timothy 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, Make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Oh, excuse me. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. 
I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Verse 8, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now this is great. So Paul is explicitly saying here in verse 8 that this crown of righteousness is up for grabs by anybody. Anybody can earn this crown of righteousness. But you know what's interesting about this crown of righteousness? It's, it's almost like the culmination of the other three crowns. Remember what the other three crowns were? The crown of glory, the crown of life. The crown of glory was for being a good example, remember? The crown of life, oh, which I, which I actually haven't got to yet. Maybe I accidentally skipped that. Oh, I, I accidentally skipped that. But um, there's the crown of life, which I'll, which I'll cover in a second. I actually accidentally skipped that. The crown of life, and then the last one was the, the, crown, of, uh, the crown of glory, the crown of life, and the crown of... Uh, Rejoicing for winning souls. But what's interesting about the crown of righteousness, if we see here in, in uh, 2 Timothy, in verse uh, 5, he says here, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. I sort of messed it up here because I was meant to tell you guys about the crown of, uh, the crown of life, which is about enduring afflictions and tribulations and temptations. But it says here, But watch thou in all things, Endure afflictions, there's the crown of life. Do the work of an evangelist, there's the crown of rejoicing. And make full proof of thy ministry. And there's the crown of glory. Now let's, before we continue on with that, let's go back to the crown of life. Because I actually forgot to show you guys that. James 1, 12. So this is actually the third last crown. So the third last crown is the crown of life. Now this one is earned by enduring trials and temptations. I just wanted to show you that. So in James 1 it says here, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. I want to see, show you the consistency here in this crown of life. Um, Revelation 2 verse 10 talks about the church here <coughs> in Smyrna, verse 10, he says, Fear none of those things with that which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So you see again, this crown of life is linked in with tribulation, is linked in with temptation. Um, let me show you here in... Uh, Revelation 3.10, again, says here, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them and dwell upon the earth. So there's this hour of temptation that is coming. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So again, this crown being linked in with this temptation, with these trials. Now, one thing I just wanted to mention here about this crown, about this crown of life, in 1 Peter 2. Of the three crowns, the crown of glory, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of life, I actually think this crown is probably the hardest one to earn. You know? um, and why is that? Because I, you know, I think it's easier to be a good example. Hey, it's easier to go soul winning and win souls to Jesus Christ when everything's going well. But how easy is it to earn a crown and endure through tribulation, through persecution. And we're not just talking about the sort of, per you know, because we don't see the sort of persecution that the Bible's talking about. I mean, it's not just, you know, having no friends at work because, you know, you know you're a Christian or, you know, not being able to go to the clubs anymore. You know, your high school friends don't want to hang around you anymore because you're a holy, holy church <laughs> roller or something. You know what I mean? That's not persecution. Just people laughing at you just because you go to church or because you read a Bible. I mean, persecution is actually being, you know, I mean, think about what happened in the Bible, like beaten, you know, not having anywhere to live, being cast out, you know, fear of death. This is the sort of persecution um, that we're talking about, actual physical um, persecution. Nowadays, it's just more spiritual. Um, you know, it reminds me of that meme on Facebook that's been going around. Have you guys seen it where it, it says, you know, in, in 1944, 18-year-olds like went through trenches and they charged beaches, uh, you know, putting their life at risk? 
But in 2015, you know, our 18 year olds need a safe place because words do hurt. And it's like this, this person with like, you know, uh, red hair and in front of their webcam. <laughs> So it sort of reminds me of that, you know, like we, we got to toughen up these days, you know, like men, uh, you know, th these men that are wearing like pink shirts and skinny jeans, you know, is, is pink necessarily a girly color? You know, I don't know whether you can really um, say it's a girly color, but I'm just saying that, you know, men need to man up. There's a lot of men that are a bit too girly, especially, especially people amongst my own culture, you know, I'm, I'm like ashamed of my own culture when I see like Asian men sometimes. I'm just like, man, why are you guys so girly? You know, just, you know, like man up a bit. And you know, even the way they talk, have you ever like worked with like these really girls? You know, they're not, they're not homosexual. They're just really girly and really weak and the way they talk, they talk with a feminine voice and you're just like, ugh, it's disgusting. <laughs> but um, you know, we need to man up a bit and, and, and take some of this persecution and, and not be so fearful of what people think. Because we don't go through the sort of things that, um, you know, the apostles went through. <coughs> Um, what was I saying? I was just saying that this crown of life, I think is probably the hardest one of the three to earn. Um, and, and look at this in 1 Peter 2. He says here, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? So he's saying here, there's no glory when you make mistakes and you, you're, you're reprimanded for it, you know, you, you're, you're buffeted for it. You do something wrong and you get in trouble, right? And you can be a good testimony there, right? You know, you do something wrong, you say sorry, you get in trouble, no big deal. But he says, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. So he's saying it's even better if you do the right thing and you suffer for it and you do the right thing. So I think there it's saying, hey, it's harder to actually suffer for the right reason than it is to suffer for the wrong reason, even though you may take it patiently, you may take it with the right spirit. <clears throat> so what are some applications for us to consider when it comes to the crown of life? Well, number one is, you know, it's worth it to endure temptation, isn't it? It's worth it to endure those trials, because sometimes when you're going through it, you know, that temptation might seem Tempting, obviously, right? Because that's why it's a temptation. I'm trying to think of a different word. But, uh, you know, that, that temptation might be very tempting, um, but it's not worth it. You know, you, you can earn this crown of life um, if you would just endure. You know, if you're going through hard times, it's worth it going through it to earn that crown of life. So succumbing to sin is never worth it. Um, and we ought to be joyful when persecution comes, because it means the rewards are greater. Because every time you come across hard times, you come across temptation, hey, that's a chance to earn this crown of life, isn't it? Now, I want to just go back to 2 Timothy 4 and just show you some things about this, this crown of uh, righteousness. <clears throat> but anyways, I thought, I thought this crown of righteousness was interesting because it's sort of like the culmination of the three crowns. Uh, and we read that in verse 5 where it says, Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, which we just talked about. Do the work of an evangelist, the crown of rejoicing. Make full proof of thy ministry. How do you make something full proof? Well, you need to have a good example, right? Where he said to Timothy in another epistle, or in the same epistle, I can't remember, where he says, Hey, let no man despise thy youth, but be an example to the believers, right? That's how he's going to make full proof of his ministry. He's going to be that good example. So, it's interesting, I think of this crown of righteousness as the culmination of the three, and it's sort of like, you know, when you play a video game and you need to get, like, the, the set, right? You need to get the crown of rejoicing, you need to earn the crown of um, glory, and you need to earn the, the crown of life. And when you get these three crowns, you can put them together, and now you've got this crown of, of righteousness. Now, how are you going to earn this crown of righteousness? What are a couple of things in 2 Timothy 4? Now, in order to earn this crown of righteousness, it's going to require two things, I can see in this passage. Verse 2, it says, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Now, verse 2 is talking about consistency, isn't it? Being instant means you do something straight away. 
So you keep keeping the commandments of God. You keep doing the right thing straight away. You don't put it off. And you do it when it's popular and when it's not popular. You do it in season and out of season. You be consistent. The other thing is I see in verse 7, I see the faithfulness, right? I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. So we see that it's not only the consistency, but it's the consistency until the end. We need to finish our course to earn this crown of righteousness. Now, just to tie this in to um, you know, New Year's resolutions. You know, I didn't really have a New Year's sermon today, but I just thought I'd tie it in. You know, everyone's making New Year resolutions because we just passed December 31. You know, it's January 3rd today. And what I want to say to you is, you know, you know don't, make, don't make New Year resolutions. Meaning, don't make resolutions that only last a year. You know, we want, we want something that's going to last forever, right? Up until we die. Up, well, not forever, but up for the rest of our life. So instead of making a New Year resolution, why don't you make a New Life resolution? resolution you know instead of just saying i'm going to do this in the new year hey i'm going to do this for the rest of my life and now when i plan this year i have that in perspective and that's going to determine how i plan the year as opposed to what i plan to only do in that year or what i'm resolved to do in that year so make new life resolutions rather than a new year resolution and you know if you make a big decision like hey you know what i'm going to be in church every week you don't have to decide every Sunday whether or not you're going to come to church. You know, if you make one big decision, you don't have to make all these little decisions. You know, I decided long ago that I'm going to go soul winning once a week. So I don't wake up Sunday morning deciding, do I feel like going soul winning this morning? Because if I made decisions that way, I probably wouldn't go soul winning. Because every Sunday I don't feel like going soul winning because the flesh wants to sleep in, doesn't want to go soul winning, you know, that, that sort of stuff, you know, wants to rest. But if I make that big decision, then I don't have to make those smaller decisions. And that's why if you make a decision to serve Jesus Christ with your life, you don't have to keep making it every year because you've already made it once. You've already decided to serve the Lord Jesus with your life. And the year is just about planning what you're going to do with that year. The other thing about New Year's resolutions is, you know, when it comes to change in your life, it's not just going to happen in one night. You know, the, the, like, the change for the year is not going to happen on December 31st. It's about being instant in season and out of season. It's about being consistent. You know, instead of just you know, being, a, a, you know, doing something great for God and just doing it, uh, you know, like being a, a, the thorny ground here and just springing up, you know, and you're excited about things and you're reading about things. And you're go, going soul winning every week. You're at church every week. And a couple of months down the road, you're gone. You know, don't have this perspective. Have a perspective where you're being consistent for the rest of your life. Why don't you just start out being, doing something week after week after week and then you'll look back at your life and realize how much you've done for the Lord. This is the way you're going to earn this crown of rejoicing. It's not about doing a great amount in a small amount of time, but doing something consistently for a long period of time. Hey, if you can do a great amount consistently, even better, right? <clears throat> even better for you. So what are some applications for us to consider when it comes to the crown of righteousness? Well, what it, what it tells me is if the crown of righteousness is a culmination of the other three crowns, and this is the crown we ought to be striving for, then we want balance in our life, don't we? We don't want to be a one-trick pony where we just, you know, I, you know I'm just crown of rejoicing. I just soul win. That's all I do. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about righteous living. I don't care about Bible. I don't care about prayer. I don't care about doctrine. I just want to win people to Jesus Christ. That's not right because we want to strive for this crown of, uh, of righteousness, don't we? One, part, one side of this is the crown of rejoicing. The other side is the crown of glory. The other side is the crown of life. We want to be balanced in our Christian life and this is what I think this crown is representing. It's representing the balance amongst having the good testimony, you know, having the righteous living, having the work of an evangelist, and then enduring through the times and, and being consistent in our faith. Um, another application hey, is finish a course. You know, it's so easy to be excited for a brief period of time. 
you know, even with our church being new, hey, it's excited. It's, it's easy to be excited about this church. It's new. There's new things that are happening. You know, everything's a first time. You know, breaking this attendance, baptizing people for the first time, doing this, doing that for the first time. Everything's, everything's exciting. But ask yourself, where are you going to be in, in five years? Where are you going to be in 10 years? Are you still going to be sitting in a church somewhere on Sunday morning? You know, I don't know how, even in, in my short life, I've seen people come and go. People that you know, were zealous, soul winning, week after week after week, and, and you know, all they wanted to talk about was the Bible. You know, they, they'd come, they were excited, they were happy. Where are they now? They're gone, you know? Because um, it's really easy. We just need to keep that in perspective. It's really easy to get excited when everything is new. But when things start getting hard, that's when you really prove how strong your faith is. Because you know, when things are going well, it's easy to do what's right. But when things are not going so well, are you still going to keep doing what's right? Are you going to finish your course, like Paul uh, says here in, in um, 2 Timothy? <sighs> and, and the last thing to, for us to consider about this crown, you know, don't compare yourself to others. We will be judged according to our own ability. So are you doing your best? Now, I just wanted to show you one last crown. Can anybody, guess, can anybody guess what it is? Sorry, I already gave you the reference there. Can anybody guess what the last crown is? Do I want to show you? Crown of thorns. <laughs> That's it, the crown of thorns. And this crown was worn by none other than our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Um, let's look here in John 19. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And, the Pilate, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. And I want you to just behold the man today. Behold the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who wore the crown of thorns. Now, what, do the, what does the crown of thorns represent? Remember when the curse came upon the earth um, after man had sinned? It brought forth the thorns and the thistles, and now man had to till the ground. Um, so what does the crown of thorns represent? It represents the curse that was brought upon the world. And, you know, Galatians 3.13 says that Christ was made a curse for us, you know, that he made us free from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Praise God. Um, and, and Pilate says here, behold the man. And, you know, we ought to regularly just behold the man and consider what Jesus Christ did for us. Because this ought to be the driving force of why you even want to earn these crowns. Why you want to earn the crown of glory, the crown of life, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of righteousness. It's because Jesus Christ was willing to wear the crown of thorn for you. He, he took the shame. He took the bur our burden. He took our sin. You know, we do not deserve this, guys. I'm sorry I'm tearing up a little, but, you know, we do not deserve this. We do not deserve what Jesus Christ did for us, but he did it. He showed that love for us, didn't he? He wore that crown of thorns. And sometimes I think we just have to behold the man and then realize how great, how much he loves us. And he's, and he's worthy. You know, he's worthy of your devotion. He, he's worthy. Oh, I, just, I just think about how imperfect we are, guys. I think about, I just think about, you know, how, how much we fall, how much, how much we don't deserve the love of God. And yet he did it for us. I don't know why I'm getting so sad right now, but I think it's because I think about what God has done for us. I think about what he did. And I think about how day after day, year after year, we fail him. You know, we don't do what's right. We do what's wrong day after day after day. And he, knowing that, went to the cross. And sometimes when I think about, you know, the doctrine of eternal security, it blows my mind how much God loves us. Because he went to the cross knowing full well everything that we would do wrong. And yet he did it anyway. You know, I think about when we talk to Muslims out, out soul winning. And um, 
You know, Muslims will often use this as an accusation against God. And they'll say, you know, how, how, how can God, so glorious, so untouchable, how could he become a man? And, and you, know, you know, they'll say things like, you know, he was born, you know, he, he came out of a woman's sexual reproductive organ and he, he came into this field, he came into this world. What sort of God would do that? What sort of God, you know, God is, and they'll say, like, God is greater than, than anything that we can even imagine. He, he's greater than his creation. You know, but what they're missing out on is the love of God. It was the love of God that drew him to come into this creation and die for us. You know, I remember talking to a Muslim out soul winning once and he's saying, you know, God becoming a man and, 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 be, and being born of a virgin, it's kind of like taking God and making him, you know, just, just, just dragging him through a sewer. You know, dragging him through the, extra, through the human excrement and just bringing him down. And I said to this Muslim, well, you know the difference? The, you know, the, 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 if I were to use that analogy and God climbing through this sewer, the reason why he's doing it is because his child is stuck in that sewer. And he's willing to climb and, and crawl through that sewer and crawl through the poo and the crap just to save that child. Doesn't that change your perspective on why God would be willing to do that? It's because he's willing to save his child. And the guy said to me, he goes, yeah, well, you know, what if, what if, what if the child, you know, is rebellious and he's, he's climbing in, he's not listening to his, to his father. But you know what? You know, Jesus Christ came for us anyway. You know, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, God was willing to climb through the sewer even if the child did not want to be saved. What, what love is that? That's, that's, that's amazing. You know, Muslims want to push God up to a point where he's so great, where he's, where he's, where he's so up there, he's so untouchable. What does the Bible say? The Bible says we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's love, my friend. That's true love. You know, the God of Islam is not a God of love. It's not a God, of, God, not a God that is willing to come for you. You know, you have to go to him. And you have to go, you know, he's so far away that he's, he's untouchable. Whereas the God of the Bible came for us. And thank God for Jesus Christ wearing this crown of thorns. Behold the man. Like the Bible says, behold him. Because the more you behold him, the more it's going to drive you to want to do something for him. Do something with your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop living for yourself. You know, we live so much for ourselves day after day, don't we? we? We go to work, we forget about the Lord Jesus Christ. We think about the things that we want to achieve in life, we forget about the Lord Jesus Christ. Take a moment to behold the man. And behold the man that died for you so that you would be compelled to do something for him. So what are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life? You know, think about it. I want to earn as many of these crowns as possible. Um, but you know what? I'm, I'm not perfect. You know, I, I think, you know, we could definitely do more as a church. And I think that's a good thought um, to sort of finish on when it comes to uh, New Year's, I guess, New Year planning, isn't it? You know, this year, let's do more for God this year than we did last year. Let's do more for God as a church than we did ever before. And, you know, let's let the love of Christ compel us. You know, I'm sick and tired of churches compelling people out of guilt. You know, and yes, you know, if you're not doing things for God, you ought to feel guilty. But, you know, do you want to be compelled to serve the Lord out of guilt? Out of fear? Out of what other people think? You know, that's why behold the man so that you'll be compelled to do things out of love. You know, I, I think that's really what gives... Um, uh, you know, like a lasting service, isn't it? You know, we talk about the thorny ground here, the stony ground here. It's people that are doing things out of guilt, doing things out of fear, doing things for the wrong reason. It, man, if you do things out of love, you'll keep doing it for the rest of your life. If you, if you think about all the people that, you know, are, are doing great things for the Lord and being consistent and doing things week after week after week after week, they're not doing it out of guilt. They're doing it because they love the Lord Jesus. So if you can get to the point where you love the Lord Jesus, you'll do things without having to be um, pressured into doing it. Well, the last verse I just want to turn to is Revelation uh, 4, verse 8. 
And we sort of sung this in uh, the verse, in the, in the chorus, uh, in the song, Holy, Holy, Holy. But in Revelation 4, 8, the Bible says here, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honour and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fell, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And I just wanted to finish on this point, because ultimately all the crowns that we earn, we're going to throw them back at Jesus, right? Because he, he is worthy for why we're even trying to earn these crowns. So again, the crown of glory, good example. The crown of rejoicing, winning souls to Jesus Christ. The crown of life, enduring temptation. The crown of righteousness is like the culmination of these three crowns. We've got the crown of thorns that Jesus Christ wore for us. And because of that, we ultimately will give our crowns back to him. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Um, thank you for the consistency. Uh, Lord, we love you. Um, we thank you that we're reminded today of, of what you did for us. Thank you, Lord, for wearing that crown of thorns, becoming a curse for us, so we can be free from the curse. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your love. Um, Lord, forgive us for our failures. Um, you know us, Lord. You know our infirmities. You know we're but dust. And we thank you, Lord, that despite our, um, our sins, you use us anyway. And pray, Lord, that you would continue to do so. Um, pray, Lord, for the people of this church. Lord, you can do great things with these people, um, greater things than I could even imagine. And I pray, Lord, that, um, uh, Lord, that they would just behold you and, and be compelled to serve you with their life. Uh, we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing uh, one more song before we break and get ready for lunch. All right, to God be the glory. Let's uh, see. I put my arm. Yeah. All right, here we go. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life at atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice oh come to the father through jesus the son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done.